moving to Michigan from North Carolina was a big change for all of us. The climate was a huge difference for us since we weren't as used to the cold, along with having to start a new school and meeting new people. However, there were other major differences as well. These ones weren't as innocent. When we first came to Michigan, our parents bought a one-story house that had originally come with two bedrooms. With having three girls, though, our parents remodeled and added another room. The neighborhood was a friendly one, with lots of children our age to play around with. It seemed like we had hit the jackpot with this home. At the time this happened, I was the youngest. When we moved, I was only five years old. For the first two years of living there, things went great. Even with the third bedroom, my sisters and I still liked to sleep in the same one, as we were all very close. Most nights we would roughhouse around and watch TV, until we were yelled at by our parents to go to bed. The night this incident happened, we were doing exactly that. It was late in the night, and my sisters and I were on the bed roughhousing. That particular night we were watching Ghost Hunters. I had gotten up to use the bathroom. I'm not sure exactly what caused me to look out the window, but I felt like something was watching me. As I turned my head to look out, fear froze me to my spot. It was like being caught in a nightmare and not being able to do anything as a face stared back at me. This was enough to send ice-cold shivers down my body and cause a knot to build up in my throat. I wasn't sure what to do. Do I call for my sisters and have them call me crazy? What if the person behind the window decides to try breaking through? I was completely terrified as I looked into this man's face and he stared right back at me. He had no expression, only these blank eyes that would keep me awake for nights to come. With a sudden burst of courage, I managed to squeak out a meek whisper. Guys, there's someone in the window. Of course, my first fear was correct, and my older sisters didn't believe me. They thought I was playing some joke on them, as I kept an eye on the face, making sure it wouldn't disappear, but at the same time wishing it would. Finally, after convincing them to just please look, they both got up and saw him. My eldest sister ran for our father, as my sister and I stood there in fright, unsure of what to do. My dad had just woken up and along with our trusty black lab wolf mix Susie, he managed to chase the man away. Our dad called the cops, but they told us that since he had not tried to break in or hurt us, they couldn't really do anything about it. We started locking our doors up tight after that. After this incident, we began to question the neighbors, and they all responded the same. The family with the fence around their property had an adult son who was mentally disabled, who would go around the neighborhood and look into girls' windows, it had even gotten so bad with one of the neighbor girls that her father had made a bat with nails sticking out of it as a threat for what could happen if the man tried to come back to his home. My parents took this pretty serious and proceeded to put inside locks and dark curtains on our windows so he couldn't see through. It seemed like the man had gotten the hint and we didn't have any more encounters. That is, until one night. My oldest sister, who was a younger teenager at the time, had just gotten out of the shower and was about to get dressed when she heard a noise at her window. She decided to stay in her towel and take a glance out the window to see what the noise was when she saw the man's face looking back at her. She screamed for my parents and immediately left her room. My dad was up with the baseball bat before you knew it and going after the man with Susie right on his heels. My dad has let Susie go ahead of him with one marching order, get him. Being the loyal dog she was, Susie took off after the man and bit his ankle, taking him down. While this was happening, my mom was on the phone with the police, who were already on their way. With help from Susie, our dad captured the man and held him there until the cops showed. They did arrest him, but because of his disabilities, he was let go the following day. My parents were furious. They couldn't understand how the police could let someone off who had been caught multiple times trespassing in people's yards and looking into younger girls' windows. They, along with the other neighbors, set up a neighborhood watch. They made sure that us kids were watched 24-7 and that no harm could come to us. Something that should be known about my father is that he's an ex-Marine who developed PTSD, with one of the side effects being insomnia. 
My dad had taken advantage of this during these incidents, as he would keep watch of the house and constantly check the yard for the man. This helped make us kids feel a lot safer, because we knew our dad was watching our backs and we'd be safe. It had been barely over a week since the man had looked into my sister's room, when he came once again. This time it was only my middle sister and I in our room. It was still early evening, and my parents and their friend were hanging out in the living room. We had an early bedtime because it was a school night, so we were both in bed about to fall asleep. When we began to hear these noises, like someone was trying to get in, fear immediately gripped both my sister and I, as we both knew what was most likely happening. Her being older and more brave, she jumped out of bed and ran to tell the adults. I, however, was once again frozen in fear, as I could hear the man trying to force open our locked window. I could do nothing more than hide under my covers and hope he wouldn't be able to get in. Thankfully, it wasn't long before the adults were in the room looking out the window. My mom came to comfort me while my dad checked things out. Since it was winter out, my dad could see the man's footprints below our window, along with his handprints on it. His temper immediately flared as he told my mom to call the cops again. He decided to take matters into his own hands and walked over to the man's house. While there, he told the man's parents what their son had been doing and that the cops were already on their way. He made sure the man was arrested this time and pressed charges as well. To this day, my sisters and I are still scared about what happened. We refuse to have any of the windows left uncovered and unlocked, and we always make sure the doors are locked as well. I'm not quite sure what happened to him after he was arrested, but there was never again a face at our window after that. Wow, do I have a crazy story for you guys. Sorry if it's a bit long, though. This experience has caused me a lot of anxiety, and it actually feels therapeutic typing this all out. During my freshman year of college in New Hampshire, a girl in my dorm hall accidentally caused a small dorm room fire by leaving in popcorn for too long at 3 a.m. We all had to evacuate, and the fire trucks came. The RAs made a pretty big stink about it. And the girl who lit the fire was the subject of many yik-yak jokes. I felt bad for her because she really, really wasn't attractive, and she looked pathetically lonely. Plus, I mean, causing a microwave fire seemed like a pretty innocent mistake for such harsh comments. A couple days after the incident, I saw her in the resident hall and made casual small talk by asking her how things were popping. Kinda just checking up on her because I felt really bad. She laughed and that was kind of it. A conversation of all of about two minutes. Fast forward to a week later and I hear a knock at my dorm room. And the same girl, who I'm now going to refer to as Popcorn, comes literally running into my room with no hesitation. I didn't even tell her my room number. At the time, I just figured she'd seen me go in there once. Cause she didn't even know my name at this point. It took me a second to realize that she was in full-blown tears. There is now a stranger on my bed in tears. I'm just sitting there like, ugh. I counsel her like the bleeding heart I am and ask her what's wrong. She tells me that the black dining hall cook sexually assaulted her and the college wouldn't fire him, so she was suffering emotionally because of it. Being a victim of assault myself, I really sympathized with her situation and gave her my phone number, just in case she needed help walking to the dining hall with a safety net and whatnot. I don't take sexual assault lightly. The night after our conversation in my room, I got a call from her to walk her down to the dining hall because the black cook that assaulted her was working that day. I walked her down to get food, and she just lit up like a glow stick. A whole new person emerged. It didn't matter that her assaultant was in the room. She was talking my ear off about pretty little liars, one direction, a lot of things I just didn't really care about. And then again, she had no one to talk to and the situation was quite complicated. I just listened and nodded my head along. Over the course of about two weeks, give or take, I had walked her down to the dining hall maybe about four or five times. She may have been a victim of assault, but she was also a very annoying and unappealing person. 
For God's sake, she even talked about herself in the third person. Her story about the assault also became inconsistent, and there were always new major developments about what had happened. The story was always changing to something much more drastic and severe. It had gone from assault to a full-on gang rape as her story developed. She then made a comment one day along the lines of how she wished that someone would drop a bomb on black people so they would finally learn to stop raping. That made me immediately uncomfortable and unsettled. I didn't want to walk her down or interact with her anymore. The week of Thanksgiving reprieve, I went back home to visit my family, while Popcorn stayed on campus. During that week, I had about 60 missed phone calls from Popcorn. One day, I even had 20 calls in the span of only a couple hours. No normal person does that. Flags were definitely raising, if they hadn't been already. When I got back on campus, there was a knock on my door. Sure enough, it was Popcorn crying again. She tells me that because I was not on campus to protect her, she was raped by a Muslim guy while walking to Panera Bread, and the Filipino RA groped and slapped her boobs. If red flags were being raised, then this was the air raid sirens. I'm no rape apologist by any means, but the rape to male interaction ratio was becoming exceptionally high. Especially since all three of these assaults happened within a month's time frame, all by people of color seemingly at random. She was making these stories up to elicit some sick form of sympathy, and as an actual victim of assault, I was beyond offended. I told her I had to leave for class and ran the fuck off to my friend to ask for advice. Well, things got real crazy real fast. I warned all the RA officers about her, and they told me they would talk to her. During class, I was up to 100 plus missed phone calls, and a series of individual messages that just said hi. I was so done with that shit. I wanted nothing to do with her. I blocked her number and went back to my dorm. That week after classes, I just went straight to my dorm. I did not want to see her anywhere. One day, I had to go to the bathroom, so I walked to the stall to do my business. I'm just casually in there peeing with my pants around my ankles, when Popcorn literally crawls on the bathroom floor and dips her head underneath the stall door. She smiles and says, Ha! I knew you would eventually come out. I was freaked the fuck out and in near tears. I tell her I'm wicked busy, I don't have time for her, and I was upset with her invading my privacy. It took a lot of courage because I struggled deeply with confrontation. She tells me all about how she's thinking of dying because her mom died when she was young. Some manipulative shit I was just not in the mood for. I leave her in the bathroom and go to my room and lock the door. I watched some YouTube and took a nap when I was rudely awoken by not knocking on my door, but a full-on pounding. I didn't answer, but the pounding just continued and got louder and louder. Open this door or I'm going to kill you. She just kept saying this. She waited and waited outside my dorm, singing songs into the door cracks for an hour. I was so scared I just cried and called my dad to pick me up. I didn't have many friends that lived on campus since it was a small college, and a lot of people commuted. This whole situation made me feel so isolated. My mental health was also rapidly deteriorating. The RAs had been informed of the threats made at my door by other students observing what had happened. She was given a warning, but of course, that was all. One night, I had my boyfriend who lived three hours away at the time come to spend the night at the college. We had been watching a movie and were now napping on my bed when we all hear the door open. Like an idiot, I had completely spaced out and forgotten to lock it. Popcorn comes running in and jumps on top of us, saying in this baby voice, Popcorn wants kiddos. I was beyond creeped out and was basically screaming, What the fuck are you doing? My boyfriend, being the no-nonsense confrontational person he is, told her to get out. She told him that she would, and I quote, just go die like her mother did when she was three and inject cancer into herself. My boyfriend smiled and said, good. He then pushed her out of the room and slammed the door, giving zero fucks. I swear he almost slammed her fingers in. I really love him. We reported her to the campus police in the morning, but still nothing major came of it. 
That was until there was another fire in her dorm not too far after, and she finally got kicked out. I wish that's where the story ends with her, but of course, unfortunately, no. After she left the dorms, my resident life became a lot easier. I made a lot of new normal friends, and I was feeling a lot less anxious as well. One day, a girl in one of my classes invited me to go to the mall with her to go to get our nails done. Now, this nail salon had clear glass, so you could see the rest of the outside mall when you were getting your nails done. I'm sitting there all relaxed, when all of a sudden I see Popcorn's face pressed up against the glass of this nail salon. She's there with this morbidly obese neck beard. I'm getting my nails done, and she's just staring at me through the window for a good 10 minutes with this man. To say that I was unnerved was an understatement. I told my friend what was going on, and we booked it out of there. They tried real hard to follow. In retrospect, I should have called the real police right then. After the mall, I started getting a bunch of random friend requests from profiles with a small Yorkie dog as the pick and several message requests as well. I opened them. They were all from Popcorn asking me to be her bridesmaid at a Pizza Hut wedding that her and her fiancé were having in two years. You can't even make this shit up. There was another message about how she was so upset I didn't acknowledge her at the mall, and she had been waiting so long to introduce me to her doting fiancé. She was upset with me and wanted to wring my neck. Of course, I blocked all these profiles, and things went pretty silent. I've been living with my boyfriend and going to school in Rhode Island for two years currently. I'm loving school, and I have an excellent group of friends. About five months ago, I had gotten home from work and noticed I had three missed calls from a random New Hampshire number. Thinking it was one of my family members, I called back. Nope, it was popcorn on the other end. I immediately hung up. There was also a voicemail left that was just a person breathing heavily into the phone and telling me I was expected at the wedding. I cried and called the police urgently about the number. I don't know what happened or if anything did come of it, but I haven't been bothered since then, so that's a plus. I'm a very kind person, and people often take advantage of this openness. It really is a fatal flaw that I'm working really hard on. It's unfortunate that there are so many unhinged and lonely people, but we really shouldn't make it our burden to help them. Sometimes being nice can actually cause a lot of mental strain. So I went to a really big public university in Florida. In my last two years, I was a resident assistant, or RA for short. Basically, I was just in charge of my floor and making sure I knew what was going on in the community. I also had a lot of good relationships with my residents as well. I had 56 on my floor, and I pretty much knew everyone there was. Let me describe how our building was set up. My floor was just one long hallway in an L shape. There were 14 suites. Each suite had four bedrooms and two baths, so no community showers. In the middle of the hall was a small laundry room and a common room. Our common room broke off into two more rooms, which were a study and a kitchen respectively. The only time I would go into the common room would be for an event or to say hello to the residents. To get into this building, you need to swipe your student ID. However, if you sat outside the door long enough, someone could scan their ID and you could slide in behind them. With that, you finally have enough background context for the story. So one Sunday night, I go into the common room to let my residents know that I was about to use it to have a meeting with one of my organizations. I walk in and see an unfamiliar man sitting with his book bag at one of the tables. I asked him his name and which floor he lived on. I just assumed he lived in our building since he was sitting alone and none of my residents seemed to know him. He responded by saying his name was Toronto and asked, What floor do you live on? This should have been a bit suspect to me, but whatever. I told him that I was the RA of this floor. Somehow, we got totally off topic of what floor he lived on. Anyway, I told everyone in the common room they could stay in the room while we had our meeting, but I just wanted to give them a heads up so I didn't disturb their studying. 
As my friends start to pile into the room, most of my residents get the social cue to move to the study room or go to their own rooms, but this Toronto stays. Our club meeting starts and we're eating and just having a good time. Our club leader tells my residents in the study room and Toronto that they can have any leftover food. Toronto grabs a plate and then jokes with us about how it would have gone great with bread. We laugh it off, but I don't think about it again until I see him eating with a piece of sliced bread. I thought it was weird he just had that on him, but I didn't say anything. Our meeting gets going and Toronto is in the kitchen. One of the members tells us how she'll no longer be a leader anymore due to dealing with the emotions of being assaulted several times. We offer words of encouragement as Toronto walks back out into the common room. Instead of just sitting at his table doing work quietly though, he jumps right into the conversation. Not having just heard the girl share about why she was leaving, he starts questioning her about why she can't be a leader and why we won't work with her so she can stay. One of the staff members just say that it's just something private. Another one of my peers said he'd talk to Toronto later. My peer didn't really tell him the girl's business, but he just wanted Toronto to shut up. He disappears just as soon as he came, and our meeting ends. I apologize to my peers and let them know that he's not one of my residents, and I have no clue what floor he's from. I feel really bad for the girl and just try to forget the whole thing. The next day, one of my residents texts me and says they were on another floor with some friends, and Toronto was saying some things that were making them uncomfortable. As an RA, I have access to just basic information for everyone that lives on campus. I don't like lockouts and moving residents in and out, so I have to verify who people are. I search our database and find no Toronto living anywhere on campus. I tell my residents that if they see him again, just go to the office and the RAs on duty will handle it. Any non-student or non-resident on housing grounds has to be escorted by a resident at all times. If not, it's considered trespassing, and we can just call Campus PD to remove them. I go to the RAs on duty and let them know what's going on and what the man looks like. We also let our supervisor know so that she's aware of what's going on in the community. I go to dinner with a friend and come back to campus. I haven't seen the man all day. That same night we had a staff meeting, so I bring it up to let the other RAs in the community know what the guy looks like and how he's not a resident. Several other RAs say they've seen him wandering around on their floor, but just assumed he lived on another. I talk with some of the other residents, and here's what I find out about him, or at least what other people have to say. He would do things like brush his teeth in the laundry room sink, ask several guys and girls on my floor if he could use their shower. This was back in October or November, and he said he'd just transferred to the school a few weeks ago. You can't do that, by the way. He said he had a younger sister that was 21. My whole community of dorms was all freshmen age 17 to 19, so if he had a younger sister that was 21, he must be at least 22-ish. The RAs on duty go do rounds twice a night and walk around the community. One of the rounds they're on my floor and knock on my door to confirm if the guy in my common room was Toronto. I don't want to go looking in the common room like a weirdo, so I just describe him again and let them verify. One RA stays up in the room hallway with me while the other calls the police and goes to meet them downstairs. I would have preferred to at least talk to him and let him know that if he wasn't a resident, he was going to have to leave, but the other RAs agreed that we didn't know how he would respond. We just called the cops in the end. I texted all my residents and let them know to stay clear of the hallway for a bit until the police arrived and left. The RA that was downstairs called and says that the police are coming up and to get out of the hallway so all my residents and the other RAs crowd into my room. I see the police in Toronto walking toward my door, and for some reason I think the police want to talk to me. I reopen my door, and Toronto tries to barge into my room. I shut the door on him and the police. I still remember this look of anger and betrayal on his face. Anyways, the police take him away and he's trespassed from campus. Not only was he not a resident, he wasn't even a student at the university. Of course, his name wasn't even Toronto either. I felt a bit bad because it obviously seemed like he was homeless, but the residents paid thousands of dollars a semester to live in a safe community at their school. When he left, we found out he had this whole secret stash of supplies in our common room kitchen, 
which is where he'd brought that bread from. I spent the last month or two praying I wouldn't run into him around the city. Mind you, as an RA, my name and contact information was plastered all over my door, so I can only hope he didn't remember it. What is up guys, Blue Spooky here, as always. Thank you guys so much for watching, especially if you made it this far to the end of the video. If you enjoyed the content that you heard in this video, please be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe if you feel so inclined. If you do decide to subscribe, make sure to hit that bell button right beside the subscribe button and turn notifications to all. Although if you would prefer not to do that, I also upload videos every day so you can just come and check every now and again and you won't miss anything. Uh, I did try to do some different editing stuff this episode to make my audio quality a little better. Let me know what you guys think, if you notice any difference or not. I think it sounds pretty good, but uh, I will have to leave that up to you guys. Uh, if you guys would like to send in your own stories to be read on the channel, you can go ahead and take a look in the description below the video. You will find links to all of my social media, including my Gmail, Facebook, and Twitter accounts. Go ahead and send me a message on any of those, and I will try to get back to you on your story as soon as possible. If you do decide to send in a story, please be sure to include in the tagline what the name of the story is if it has one, what type of story it is if it has one, and how you would like to be credited in the description of the video the story appears in. If you decide to send in a story, please make sure to include proper grammar and spacing if you can, as well as as much information as you feel comfortable sharing. That will give it the highest possibility of appearing in a video in the future. Uh, if you guys have any criticisms on anything I can do better, please be sure to leave those in the comments as well, as I am always looking for new ways to improve the channel. Uh, if you guys like my stuff here, as always, I have two other channels that I run, called Mr. Blue Skies and Darkest Hour respectively. I do true crime videos and documentaries on dark things that have happened in history on the other one. So if you like my stuff here, check those out if you feel like it, maybe those will be for you. Uh, overall though guys, I think that's pretty much it for now. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I hope you guys have a great day. A few friends and I were going out on a camping trip that was going to span the course of four days. It would most consist of hiking and fishing on the lake. We had gone on this trip for the past four summers in a row, and every year we chose to go up to the campground toward the end of the season in the hopes of it not being overly crowded. However, this year we had to change the plans a bit to accommodate a few people in our group who could only make the trip in July. So we ended up at the campground during one of its busiest weeks. But that didn't bother anyone too much. Overall, we were all just happy to be there. In fact, because there were other people on the lake with us, we managed to find out about a couple of other trails nearby that we hadn't yet explored. One of which included a large cave that was said to have gone back nearly a mile into the mountain. And the best part was that it was rather a large cave, so we didn't have to worry about squeezing through too many tight spaces. So on our second day, we all decided to go on a hike through the trail that would bring us into the cave. We figured it would be a ton of fun. And for the most part, we were right. The inside of the cave was way bigger than we expected it to be, and with our flashlights on our phones, we could see everything around us. Perhaps the best part was how cool it was the deeper we could go into the cave compared to the stifling heat that came from standing in the sun. As we made it deeper into the cave, I remember my friend Ryan saying how he was starting to get the creeps, and a few others agreed with him. So we decided that we would only go a bit further in before turning around and heading back to the campground. We pressed on a little further, and at that point, I had been standing toward the back of the group when out of nowhere, we all just stopped. The few people in the front of the group all let out screams that echoed back throughout the cave. And as everyone began to scramble, I caught a glimpse of what they were screaming at. Lying on the floor was the body of someone, and it wasn't entirely clear at first as to where the blood was coming from, but there was clearly a pool of blood on the floor around it. We all spreaded out of the cave as fast as we could and got a hold of the authorities, which included the police and campground security. 
After a couple of hours, we were notified that the body had been identified as someone who had been there with their family on vacation and had gone missing earlier that day. The body was found with multiple stab wounds and lacerations across the upper body. All of us felt pretty uncomfortable staying at the campgrounds and actually got two hotel rooms for the night. We weren't given any more information on the body that we found in that cave, but we had to leave and had chosen not to use that campground anymore. It just doesn't feel quite right. If you have ever visited the mountains of Utah, you might know that they are riddled with cave systems and caverns that make for great exploring and hiking trips. This was me and my cousin David's favorite thing to do when I would visit his house for the summer. It was a yearly thing that would happen every summer. I would get dropped off at my aunt and uncle's house toward the end of June, and I would spend a few weeks there with a bunch of my cousins. A lot of time was spent out on the lake and walking the trails, but any chance that we could, me and my cousin would go traversing through the local systems that he knew about. Well, this past summer was no different, except we'd learned a very valuable lesson about paying attention to the weather. After spending about two weeks at my cousin's this past summer, we finally had some time to go out in the trails. And since David had been taking up this new cave system that he had found, we figured we would check it out. Every time he talked about this particular set of caves and tunnels, he always talked about how tight some of the spots were that we were going to have to squeeze through. But he promised that the beautiful chambers inside would be more than worth it. And once I saw them for myself, he wasn't wrong. After letting our family know where we were going, I remember my uncle telling us to look out for the weather. We didn't pay the comment any mind, and once we headed out, it was only about 45 minute drive to the trail that led us to the cave entrance. And when we first walked up to the threshold of the cave system, it honestly didn't seem that special. It was rather a wide entrance, and from the looks of it, the tunnel systems weren't going to get nearly as tight as David had told me. After about 20 minutes of smooth walking from chamber to chamber, however, the two of us did eventually come up to a place where most explorers in the cave would stop. In front of us was a wall where the only way through it would be to get into our stomachs and crawl through a space that was no more than a foot wide at the most. David and I looked at each other and both agreed that this was what we had come here for. After crawling and wiggling our way through the narrow space that dipped up and down as we moved forward, we eventually made it through to one of the large chambers that David had told me about. And I mean when I say that he wasn't wrong, it's hard to describe why it was so beautiful but to be in a space that had been practically untouched by mankind was truly something amazing. After taking in the experience, the two of us pressed on further for about an hour of exploring. Throughout that hour, we would squeeze through more narrow spaces that were making their way down, deeper into the cave system. There were actually a few occasions on the way in that we thought we might get stuck or wedged, but after a bit of pushing, we were able to squeeze through. And after a while, we both came to the decision that we had seen enough, and it was probably time to head back. It wasn't until we began crawling back through that both of us realized that we might be in some serious trouble. You see, as I said, the tunnels that we had been crawling through were ultimately bringing us down deeper into the earth. And the reason my uncle had warned us about the weather was that there was a huge rainstorm that had been heading out way. And had we paid more attention and known about this, David and I would have never entered the caves that day. As we continued to crawl through one of the tighter cracks and toward one of the chambers that were in the direction of the exit, David and I began to notice a small puddle of water forming on the path. And as we made it into the chamber, it was clear that we had been trapped in by water that had flooded into the cave. The two of us began to panic as we quickly realized that there was a chance that the water would keep coming in and that we had nowhere to go. There was no way that we could crawl back out of the tunnels as we don't know how much of it had filled with water and if it would be passable or not. All we could do was wait as the water slowly trickled by and hope that the crevices leading out of the chamber would clear up, indicating that the flooding had stopped. David and I did our best to stay calm for the hours that we had been trapped in that chamber, but to our luck, the water did eventually clear up as it continued to trickle past us. The rain outside must have stopped, and after taking out time to think about our options, the two of us decided that we should try to crawl out. We still had about 20 minutes of crawling and squeezing through the tight and narrow passes before we finally made it back to the walkable trails that led us out of the cave. To our surprise, my aunt and uncle, David's parents, were waiting right at the entrance of the cave with a couple of emergency workers. After we didn't make it back by the time the storm started, my uncle knew that something wasn't quite right and decided to get a few of his friends together to form a search party in case something had happened. I'm just happy that we made it out. That one was far too close. By now, a lot of people have heard about Hellhole. It's a very deep and narrow cave system that leads deep into the ground in the Germany Valley area of West Virginia. I, like most cave explorers, 
after hearing about Hellhole, decided to make the trip out there for myself to check it out and see how terrifying it truly was. And as while I'll say it was one of the best and most interesting adventures of my life, I can safely say that I will never be going back there. Now most people will tell you that when you are going exploring to never go alone, and I agree wholeheartedly. However, I couldn't find anyone who would go with me at the time, so I made the foolish decision to visit Hellhole for the first time all by myself. The descent into Hellhole begins by squeezing through a small metal entryway that was originally placed there to keep explorers out of the tight and deadly caverns that lie beneath the ground. However, they gave up trying to seal off the entrance after it had been torn open and entered anyway. Now it's simply a place where you go at your own risk. If anything happens to you while you're in Hellhole, no one can come and bring you out. It's far too narrow for that. And again, I was foolishly doing this exploration alone. As I made my descent into the cave system, I could see right away why Hellhole was considered an expert's only plunge. I had done a lot of research beforehand and thanks to lines that had already been placed down there by those who have previously visited the hole, I was able to keep my way and know that I was heading in the proper direction. For a few holes that I had to squeeze through, I made sure to lead myself in the legs first and keep my arms free to ensure that I didn't get stuck, and this worked out for a while. I managed to spend about an hour and a half inside of Hellhole before deciding to head back. I had just reached a chamber that I had descended into from a small narrow crack that led into the chamber from above. Once I was inside, I sat for a while, caught my breath, and took in the signs of the crystals that used to line the wall before being broke by other explorers. I looked around me and back up the hole that I had come down from and began assessing exactly how I would maneuver my way back up. I figured I could go with my right arm first and sort of wiggle and wedge my way upward through the pass. Sadly, I miscalculated, and after pulling myself upward into the passage, I stopped. With the angle that the tunnel went, I would have had to tilt my body to the side, and the angle I had gone up at had caused me to get wedged in the narrow pass that was no wider than my chest. I couldn't even take in a full breath as I was stuck, which didn't help with my attempts to stay calm. I did everything I could to try to work my way out of that position, but the more I moved, the more I feared that I was getting wedged even worse. Panic began to set in, and as I came to the realization that I might be stuck in that position, and even if someone had found me, there would be very little that they could do to help me out. If I couldn't force my way through or back into the chamber below, I was theoretically trapped for good. The more I began to panic, the more I began to wiggle, wither, and thrash my way around in hopes of breaking free. And then, everything went black. I don't know how much time passed before I woke up. But as I slowly opened my eyes, I can only make out two things. The first being that I had somehow managed to end up on the floor of the chamber that I had been trying to climb out of, meaning I must have somehow gotten loose and fallen. The other thing I could make out clearly was the throbbing sensation that was going on in my head. That's when I realized that I must have knocked my head when I was in a panic, and perhaps it was my body going limp from being knocked unconscious, but I somehow managed to slip free. Now, I knew that if I were to attempt to escape from Hellhole again, I would have to be extremely cautious with every move I made not to get stuck again. And after really working it out, I decided to try to ascend out of the cave system once again. It took me about three hours of carefully picking my position, but I eventually made it back up into the open air. And after making it back to my car, I decided to go to the hospital to get my head checked out. There was a small wound where I had hit my head that required